special episode number five, my fearless friends, with someone that got me truly excited and emotional, an amazing person inside out, Robert Mack, who is the reason why I met my spiritual mentor, Glenn Marsden. And it is so funny that Robert doesn't really know the story, doesn't know the behind the scenes. So what happened last year? Of course, looking for answers, wanting to find a way to stop this pain that I was feeling because of the ego. And I had no idea it was the ego back then. Luckily, I was checking my stories on Instagram and somehow, I don't know how, but I think it was something divine that Robert was one of the persons that checked one of my stories. His profile immediately drew my attention. And as I saw that he is a happiness coach, among other amazing achievements, I said, okay, now this is something that I'm interested in. I want to be happy. Who doesn't, right? So I began following him. And about a month later, I saw this guy, I saw Glenn talking to Robert. He was interviewing Robert on the Imperfectly Perfect campaign podcast. And something felt, okay, you know what? I can listen to this guy. I can listen to Glenn talk for hours. There's something really genuine, something that drew me really strongly towards him and towards the Imperfectly Perfect campaign. And little did I know, a month later, Glenn was on my podcast on stories about fear and long story short, I am thriving my fearless friends. The way that Glenn can connect to people's hearts is unbelievable and it's all thanks to Robert. This is such an honor to have him today and as you may have seen some of my posts about Robert's work. He is the author of this amazing masterpiece. It's not a book. As I was telling Robert earlier, this book is so much more beyond the expectations that I had because he not only is really transparent, sharing his story fully, but he gives so many basic, normal very natural advice that we all know. As Robert says at the beginning of his book, you know these things about happiness. It's basically finding the resources within. We all struggle. We all are having so many things going on in our lives that we think happiness is just a mundane work. But in just a few seconds, Robert Mack is going to tell us what it really means. My amazing guest is an Ivy League educated positive psychology expert, celebrity happiness coach, published author. By the way, again, such a fan and my fearless friends, you will find the link to get this amazing book in your hands because it is something that you truly need. It's your ABC in life, to say the least, and you'll see what I mean. And he's also a television host and producer. His work has been endorsed by Oprah, Vanessa Williams, Lisa Nichols, and many others. In addition to serving as celebrity love coach for Famously Single on the E! Network for two seasons, Robert also worked as consulting producer and on-camera expert for Mind Your Business on the OWN Network and executive producer and host of Good Morning La La Land on Apple TV and Hulu. Oh my God, so many amazing achievements. Robert, welcome. It is an amazing privilege to have you here on Stories About Fear with us today. Thanks so much for having me. That was the most loving, generous, and kind introduction ever. I feel like I owe you some money back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna pay you just to be my publicist. Uh, that was beautiful, and I feel humbled um, and grateful to be here. You are the kindest, and I am just really curious, Robert, to know a part of your story. What do you want to share with our audience? Because I've read it in the book, and I think it's spectacular in terms of you being so honest. I love 
the honesty and the transparency. What do you want to share from your story with our audience so that they know how amazing you grew up? Yeah, um, so many things. The first thing is that I wasn't always happy. I remember being depressed and suicidal um, at six or seven years of age. My first memories were of stress and anxiety and of self-loathing and self-judgment. And I always thought I'd grow out of it. I thought I'd excel in school, hopefully. I'd excel in sports, hopefully. And as a result of that, I'd feel better. I'd become happier. But it didn't happen. I just continued to feel worse despite doing better in life. I was salutatorian in my high school class. I played baseball and football and basketball and cross country. And I excelled in lots of that. I went on to a great college and eventually got a great consulting job. But despite my life getting better on the outside, I felt worse and worse for it on the inside. And it got so bad that I decided I was going to do something about it. So I went online and I began to research the means and methods uh, to kill myself. And I decided I was going to slash my wrist. And I remember going to the kitchen, getting a kitchen knife and digging the knife into my wrist. And I still have the suicide test marks wow. on my wrist to this day. But as I did that, as I dug this knife into my wrist, the most unexpected thing happened without anything in my external circumstances or conditions changing. I mean, I had a good life and that was part of the frustration is I had a good job. I hated the job and I liked the people. I made good money. I had a girlfriend at the time. I was healthy. My family was very loving. Despite all of that, I felt terrible on the inside. And when I dug this knife in, for seemingly no good reason, I felt peace and love and joy, the kind of which I had never felt before. And that was so unpredictable and so inexplicable at the time that I decided I was gonna postpone the suicide for like five or 10 minutes. And at the time that was a very tall order. I didn't think I could even last that long. But in that five or 10 minutes, I began to do a different kind of research. I looked up happiness and I looked up what depression was. And that five or 10 minutes stretched into a few hours and then a few days. And now it's been several decades. And it wasn't a linear path. I didn't just get happier and happier every day. Some days it was two steps forward and 2,000 steps backwards. But slowly but surely, I got there. I got to where I am today. And so I guess I want to share that most importantly to let people know that I don't write about happiness or anything else that I write about. Um, just because I like hearing myself talk or seeing words that I have thought on paper. I share it because I genuinely care about people and I know what it's like to suffer. And I love the idea of everybody suffering a lot less. Wow. I appreciate you sharing this story and I literally got goosebumps. And I'm truly interested to know, Robert, why do you think that people are in pain? What do you think that the main reason is? Overthinking, unconstructive thinking, unproductive thinking. The brain is a phenomenal problem solving instrument. In fact, that's its job to find and solve problems. But it's just as good at, if not even better at, creating problems. It's a phenomenal troublemaker. And that troublemaking ability starts at a very young age. And most of the very well intentioned adults that raise us don't ever teach us because they don't know themselves that there's a way out of the pain and suffering, the psychological and emotional pain and suffering particularly. And that way out isn't through more thinking, at least not at first. And if it is through more thinking, it's through constructive thinking, better thinking, productive thinking. A lot of the thinking that we do is redundant and negative. It's the same old thoughts over and over again. And most of them are negative, unconstructive, unproductive, unsupportive, unhealthy, and unhappy. This is this is the thing that I also believe about our mind. It's basically negative by default. And I'm fascinated about our mind, about how it works. So I began specializing as a fear specialist a few years ago, just wanting to see what's really happening in our mind. Why is it that we just look at the empty part of the glass, right? When we have, as you said, so many, you had so many achievements 
but yet you felt like you were dying on the inside. You what nailed something. Are... Please yeah, go. Um, the brain, uh, to go further and deeper based on the really eloquent statement you just made, the brain is designed for survival, not primarily and certainly not exclusively happiness. That being said, if you survive, it's a lot easier to be happier in this physical body at least, right? And so for that reason, when a problem is solved, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense from a survival perspective to continue to focus on the problem that's been solved. Instead, this survival focused brain focuses on the next problem that it needs to solve to keep you alive. And so it's doing a phenomenally you know, great job at that, of keeping you alive by getting you to focus on the problems. The only issue with that, or one of the issues with that, is that it's sort of like operating a computer system or your iPhone based on outdated software, you know? And so we're sort of like, you know, using this sort of like primitive mind often to live our lives. And that primitive mind is based in fear and it's based in anxiety and it's focused on negativity. There, of course, is a negativity bias built to the brain. Lots of biases built to the brain for that purpose of keeping us alive. And that doesn't serve our happiness very well. And so we want to just do a little upgrade. You know, we want to make sure that we're sort of bringing to bear um, other ways and means and methods of living our lives, ones that can lead to just as successful, if not even more successful lives, but also happier lives. I love that. I so much love that. And I'm so grateful that you shared that because my next question to you is, how long does it take to build the happiness muscle? And I have a feeling that our fearless friends watching us and listening to us know that it's obviously not an overnight achievement. Let's be honest, these things take time. However, our mind thinks that, okay, I'm not happy now. I will never be unless I have X, Y, Z, the car, the house, and so on. What would you say that the average amount of time for someone is to build the happiness muscle like you so amazingly mentioned in your book? So phenomenal question. Um, if you're consistent, and by consistent, I mean every day, and you follow through on your happiness practices, and we'll talk about those a little later, it can take as little as 22 to 66 days. We know that's how long it takes to rewire the brain in ways that makes happiness and peace and love and self-love easier, almost automatic. That being said, it does require vigilance your entire life, your entire life. I've been at this work of happiness and sharing teaching happiness to people for over 20 years, and I still need to be vigilant. Um, and that doesn't mean that it's painful. It doesn't mean that it feels like work. In fact, I would encourage people to try to make it fun and keep it enjoyable. And the more fun it is, and the more fun you can have with it, and the more enjoyable it is, the more consistent you'll be, and the more persistent you'll be. And as a result of that consistency and persistency, you'll find that you'll keep it up and you'll succeed in becoming happier and happier all the time. It won't be something you dread. And for that reason, you'll look forward to it and you'll do it a lot and you'll do it well. So I would say 20, as little as 22 to 66 days, if you practice every day and you really mean it. Now, the challenge and opportunity there is that you have to prioritize happiness above everything and everyone in your life in order to get really good at it really fast. And that can be very difficult. Um, the world is noisy. Other people's voices are noisy. Our own minds are noisy. And they have their own opinions about what you should be doing with your life that probably conflicts with your desire to be happiness or to be happy, it seems often. And so you have to make these very hard decisions, which in the end of the day can also be very easy decisions. They're very easy decisions when like me, you've realized that doing it their way doesn't get you very far. It just leads to a more and more miserable life. And when you come to the kind of clarity that I was lucky and blessed to come to, which was that I'd rather, um, I'm going to live blissfully as possible or not live at all. That kind of single-minded focus and clarity, I think was a huge boon and benefit to me in a way that isn't to a lot of people. So a lot of people say, oh, poor Robert, he suffered with depression and suicidal ideation for so long and had the suicidal experience. But I see it the other way. I'm like, thank God that I did because it brought me face to face with the recognition that if I'm not happy, what's the point of everything else? And if I can be happy, even if I don't have anything else I want, 
I have what I truly want. I have happiness. Happiness is why I want everything I want. And that's why I would say happiness is the highest health because it's the reason you want health. It's the greatest love because it's the reason that you want love. It's the highest wisdom because it's what all wisdom strives for and strives after, right? It's the greatest wealth. It's the greatest success because it's what all wealth and all success ultimately aims at or for. It is the meaning and purpose in life, the whole end and aim of human existence because that feeling that we call happiness, that we might also call fulfillment or contentment or peaceful aliveness or just peace is the reason we want everything and anything we want. It's a feeling we're ultimately after. And when you have the feeling, everything else is just icing on the cake. My mind is spinning now in the most amazing way. I am just so thankful that you are mentioning these things. Like I'm absorbing it all. It just gives so much amazing food for thought for me. And I'm sure that everyone watching us and listening to us are going to appreciate this so much. Wow. Like, wow. <laughs> I never thought of it like this. I appreciate it. And you know what? The thing that comes to my mind right now is that I just need to continue to put myself first, like 100% all the time. How does that sound to you in, in regards it. to happiness? I love it so much. And a lot of people will have a knee-jerk reaction against that. Um, something I discovered and learned the hard way is that it takes an authentically selfish person to be authentically selfless. Um, many people have said that. Uh, I was a big Michael Jordan fan as a kid. I remember reading a quote by him that was very similar to that. What does that mean? That means in the beginning, you need to be selfish enough to fill up your own tank. When your tank is full, you have something to pour into other people. If you don't do that, if you don't fill up your own tank first and you try to pour into other people, not only will you have nothing to pour, to a large extent, you might make those other people's lives worse off. Sort of like two beggars getting together and trying to make each other better off. They don't, they tend to make each other worse off, right? If I have nothing and you have nothing and I try to get something from you, then I'm uh, not helping you, I'm hurting, hurting you, right? And so the idea is that if you can be selfish enough to prioritize happiness above all else, you'll fill up your tank and you'll finally have something to share. And not only will you have something to share, you'll share it without an expectation of reciprocity, without any strings attached. You're not sharing or giving to get something. You're not extending love to extract love from the other person. You're extending it. You're sharing it. You're giving whatever you're sharing and giving out of the overflow without an expectation of reward, without any quid pro quo, and without desire to get. And that is what I would call true giving. That's authentic giving. That's true selflessness or unselfishness, which is very rare in the world. Most of us don't give for the joy of giving. We give to get. Wow. Do you think that there is any type of love that's unconditional since you mentioned this? Absolutely. Uh, what a great question. And just uh, sidebar here, you are so generous in the way in which you... Um, connect and have connected with me and the way in which you conduct these interviews um and i've listened and i'm so appreciative of that i mean that really really generous um it means a world the world to me so thank you for that um yes life and existence loves all of us unconditionally and you'll notice that because wow. right i would say that's the first biggest greatest piece of evidence some people call that life, existence, the universe, or infinite intelligence. They might call it God. You can call it anything you want, but whatever it is that, quote unquote, brought you into this world that will take you out of this world, if you notice, without working at it, without earning it, without deserving it, you've been given the greatest gift at all of all, which is life itself. Um, the number of people that are lucky enough to be gifted with life relative to the number of people that could be gifted with life. It's, it's so small, right? I mean, we're so lucky. We all hit the lottery in just being born, period, okay? Even if you've been born into not great circumstances, you still hit the lottery because life is the greatest gift. More than that, you'll notice that the things that matter most, the air that you breathe, um, you know, hopefully and ideally lots of, for lots of folks, but not for others, um, clean water, things like this. If you look around your life and you look at how many countless things and people and elements and aspects there are to appreciate it does it seems endless and so life existence the universe continues to love you 
unconditionally, despite you earning it or not. In um, scripture, in the Bible, it says, um, it rains on the just and unjust alike. So, right, the sun shines on the just and the unjust alike. Um, and so all of that for me is the first proof. The second proof is that um, I have felt unconditional love from people in my life. Sometimes it's been complete strangers. Sometimes it's been people close to me. Um, but without question, even if you've experienced unconditional love for one moment or one micro moment, that's all the evidence you know that you need to know that it exists. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing this. What an amazing reminder. Gosh, Robert, I have forgotten about that, to be honest. You know, looking at my life right now, you're just now making me analyze my existence <laughs> with these amazing thoughts. Since just, you know, as I told you earlier, so many things happening with kindergarten, the challenge of my life. <laughs> this is <laughs> the challenge of my existence. When we are all adjusted with kindergarten, I can say like, look at me, I'm just like this amazing winner in all ways. <laughs> but I'm thinking like, yes, you are so right. How could I have not thought about that, which is again, so obvious. It's right in front of us. It's divinity just granting us with this beautiful gift of life. And you shared it so amazingly. And I so appreciate this, Robert. This is just such heart sharing that my fearless friends, uh, did you expect that this is going to be so outstanding now you know why i have been raving about robert because he is just so honest and so down to earth and this means that you are grounded in everything in love in this beautiful planet that we are just so lucky we're just so lucky robert to say home to to call home mm -hmm. and i wanted yeah. to ask you what are these happiness principles these eight amazing things that we should focus on. Absolutely. And um, I can actually uh, probably sum it up in four. Okay, so I'll sum all eight up in four. Yeah. And um, the first is just happy activities. Okay, so there are activities that we all love doing for their own sake that are intrinsically rewarding, intrinsically motivating. We want to identify those activities and try to schedule more and more of them into our lives. Very simple, very simple. But most of us forget to do that. And we think we don't deserve to do that, that we should suffer um, or that we should be in pain and that somehow we're earning points that way. Uh, but that's not my experience. Um, and that's not my um, philosophy at all. Uh, to get there, sometimes we have to identify what we call our happiness deserts. So as opposed to the happiness islands, which are activities you love, you identify your happiness deserts. Those are activities that you don't love for their own sake, that stress you out or make you anxious or demotivate you or make you feel not so happy to be alive. You wanna identify those and then try to get as many of them off your plate as possible. You can do that through one of seven ways. The first is, um, well, the first two, reduce or eliminate. So if you can stop doing it or do less of it, please do it. Uh, if you can outsource or delegate, pay someone else to do it, get, ask someone else to do it. Automate or regulate, automate in the same way you do bill pay click a button once and then every month it comes out of your account or regulate, which just means less frequently and innovate is the seventh one. And innovate just means let's try to be and think through the laziest but smartest way to get done this thing I need to get done, right? So we call that lazy intelligence. That's step, that's the first step. Now, as you continue down this path, you discover that even when you're doing the happiest things and you've eliminated or reduced, outsourced, automated, regulated, innovated on the things you don't love doing, you still might find yourself not feeling so content or happy inside. And so you graduate from this idea that happiness is about activity. And you come to realize it's also about people. And so you want to perform the same practice with people. You identify the people that are your happiness islands, essentially. People that make you feel supported and loved and they inspire you to be happy. Make it easy to be happy. You want to spend more time with those people and you want to identify the people that are maybe falling in your happiness deserts. Those are people that you don't feel so supported by, that drain you, that make you not feel so happy to be alive. And you want to spend as little time with them as humanly possible. Sometimes they are family members and so you still feel like you have to spend time with them. But then make your interactions 
more frequent, but shorter and sweeter. You get in, you get out. Okay. At some point, however, you graduate even beyond this and you say, I'm spending lots of time doing things I love with people that I love and who love me, but I still don't feel happy or content. So you graduate to the third out of the fourth step, and that is happy thoughts. We'll call them happy thoughts. But the idea is to tell yourself and to talk to others in ways that expresses the truthful, better feeling story or way of talking about or thinking about that theme, subject, or person. So in other words, you know, you might be broke and have no money and save you zero dollars. You could say and tell the story that you're broke and things are going horribly, which I would assume feels true. It's just as true to say, I'm really looking forward to making a whole lot more money and or there's only up from here. There's only up from here. But the first story was truthful, but worse feeling. The second story is just as truthful, if not more truthful and better feeling. You're wanting to practice vetting thoughts and conversations, not based solely on whether or not they're true, but also based on whether or not they're better feeling. Does thinking this and talking about this support me in feeling what I wanna feel, achieving what I wanna achieve and being who I wanna be? Now, at some point you realize that even when you have the most constructive, supportive, truthful and better feeling stories and thoughts in your head, and are surrounded by the most loving, happy people and are engaged in the most happy and exciting, inspiring activities, you still feel stressed out, anxious, depressed, lonely, whatever it might be. And so you graduate to the final step, which really is the only step that you need, which is happy no thoughts. Happy no thoughts is learning to not think. It's learning to experience the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. The eternal sunshine of the spotless mind is the recognition that happiness isn't something you do. It's not someone you find or spend time with. And it's not something you think. It's something, no thing, it's nothing, it's no thing, it's not a thing, that exists within you at all times, in all places, regardless of all thoughts, despite what you do and do not have, and despite who and who you do not have in your life. And so it's the peaceful aliveness that exists within you at all times, in all places, regardless of what you think, and only thinking can convince you otherwise. And so the idea is very simply, happiness is presence, and presence is not thinking. Wow. Yeah. This is just phenomenal. This is brilliant, Robert. Thank you for saying these amazing things. Literally, I've not heard of more than half of it, and it fascinates me, and I just can't wait to read more of your book. This is just wow. I love the no thoughts, place, and happiness being presence, and it just makes so much sense now that I think about it. I'm just processing what you're saying, and I'm just so excited to learn these things from you, and my fearless friends, you may want to get a pen and a piece of paper because this is a master class on happiness and on just fe feeling alive and appreciating what you have this is wonderful robert and you know since we are stories about fear and since you mentioned presence and indeed when we are present we are not fearful what does fear mean to you mm. Um, fear is the opposite of love, but love is all encompassing. It's all embracing. And that which is all encompassing and all embracing has no opposite. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'll say that again. And that's, um, part of a paraphrase from A Course in Miracles, but, um, the opposite of fear is love, but that which is all encompassing and all embracing, meaning love is all encompassing, all embracing has no opposite, can have no opposite. And so I'd argue that, wow. as another quote would put it, and it doesn't go as, go far enough, but essentially the quote is, fear is a mile wide and an inch deep. In other words, we all had that experience as a kid where you think of there's a monster under the bed. And the fear feels so real, real. And then one day you look under the bed and you see there's no monster. And then there's therefore no fear. 
And then you quickly come to realize that the fear was illusory. The fear was mesmerism. It was hypnotism from the very beginning. The fear was fantasy, it was projection, it was imagination. It was never reality. And so there's an argument here, one that I put forth, which is that while the fear you feel is real, real, it feels real, the deeper reality with the capital R is that there is no fear. There is only love or call to love. And that's the way to put it. Another way to say it is we make it all up. We make it all up. Okay. We make it all up. And so um, if you're fearful of something, recognize that and uh, don't beat yourself up for that. And you don't necessarily need to do anything about it and say, well, you don't have to do anything about a mirage. But in time, as you deepen your practice, whether it's a mindfulness practice, happiness practice, prayer practice, meditation practice, whatever it is, you'll come to discover that you don't need to do anything about fear, but see through it, just see through it. Um, you know, when you're a child, you're afraid of the monster on the bed. When you're an adult, you're afraid of uh, terminal disease. You're afraid of death. You're afraid of not having enough money. One day, hopefully not, you might have a few of those experiences and you'll see through them. Right? You begin to see through them like, oh, wow, I was scared of the thing. I remember the first time, just real quickly, I was afraid that I was going to lose my job. And one day, essentially, that happened. And uh, I had to give up two beautiful German cars, and I didn't have a place to live. And I remember thinking, this isn't so great. And also, all the fear went away. No fear. Oh. No fear. In fact, I felt relief, and I probably felt happier than I'd ever been before, because there's no fear. Right? So Byron Katie says it well. The worst thing that can happen to you in life or on your deathbed is simply a belief, and that belief is a fearful one. What a fresh, different approach to fear. I appreciate this, Robert, so much. And you know, my fearless friends, I was telling you <laughs> to get a pen and a piece of paper. I'll be doing the same thing. I'm going to watch this video, listen to the episode again, and just have these things down on a piece of paper, because this is just brilliant knowledge. I've never heard this before, Robert, and it excites me so much. I'm such a huge content consumer. I'm just really curious, and I am loving this so much. I appreciate you for sharing these amazing thoughts. And now the cherry on top. My fearless friends, you know that the Imperfectly Perfect Campaign book series, volume number one, is out now to pre-order it has changed my life the imperfectly perfect campaign is the best thing that has ever in my life happened to me because I may not be here in this very moment if it were not for Robert having me to meet Glenn through that amazing Instagram post it's funny how life works and Robert is now one of the amazing supporters, giving us the chance to have his foreword in this amazing volume number one. I wanted to ask you, Robert, what does being imperfectly perfect mean to you? It means to be unconditionally self-loving and unconditionally loving. It means to see through and not judge by exterior or outer appearances and to see through to the reality which is perfection behind the apparent imperfection on the surface and so it's to mm -hmm. love yourself the self the christ mind the buddha mind whatever it is that we'll call the essence of who and what you are we'll call it life itself whatever hangs the earth on no nothing re rotates it on its axis revolves around the super hot star that we call sun at just the right distance to not burn us up or freeze us whatever that intelligence is because it's infinite is also within us and so imperfectly perfect means to me to recognize the loving happy peaceful essence of every single living entity and creature on the planet beautifully said and it basically reminded me now as I was listening to you just now that we need to start removing the labels for everything and anything because as you said about fear we make it up we just make up so many things our minds are 
the best Hollywood movie script scenario, directors, any way you want to call it, because it's one thought, one fear that may lead to so many other things. Like you said, you were afraid of losing your job and it happened. Your mind gave you what you were focusing on. How do you think that we can remove the labels and get to that point of no thought place this question was kind of bugging me for the last five minutes <laughs> since it it really sounds brilliant and so whew, so relieving yeah and it's easier than we make it out to be when folks first hear this i know when i first heard it it sounded impossible uh every night for six or seven or eight hours you fall asleep and in your deep slumber you forget the world you forget other people you forget yourself you forget all your fears and desires and you enter into something most of us would call bliss, peace, you know, sublime. That's how easy it is. It's entering into a sleep-like state, but with alertness, with awareness. And we do it all day long. When you're in flow state, same state, really. When you're in flow state, you're so deeply engaged and absorbed in an activity that you have no interest, time, or energy in evaluating how you're doing it all. You're just focused on what you're doing. You're enjoying it so deeply. That flow state, just like sleep, is essentially what we all crave and desire in every experience, in love, in intimacy. We eat great food, we go for a walk, when we talk about happiness, when we go to church, we're wanting that flow-like state, flow state experience. And so the idea is just practice. And a simple practice is just this. Every day, remind yourself, as often as you can remember, that you might have a hundred years left in this beautiful human flesh costume, hopefully, or you might have a day or an hour or five minutes or less. And it's not to be morbid, it's just to be honest. We wanna be as sincere about that as possible. And so we wanna remember that this one breath we're taking right now is the most important breath we could ever take because it's the only breath we have. We don't have access to a future breath. We don't have access to any past breaths. Same thing goes for the moment. This moment is the most important moment because it's the only moment of our life. Our entire life is captured, it's encapsulated by this one moment. And so the idea is to treat it as such. So you let all your thoughts go. You breathe in through your nose, through the stomach. You let the stomach expand on the inhale and it contract on the exhale. And as you breathe back out of the mouth, your entire goal and intention is simply to enjoy that breath as deeply as humanly possible. You're not trying to get good at it. You're not trying to be spiritual. You're not trying to be ethical. You're not trying to achieve no mind. You're not trying to achieve no nirvana. None of that. For one moment in your life, you're trying to deeply, truly, and consciously enjoy that moment, enjoy that breath, and juice it for as much happiness as you could possibly get out of it. You want to be a total hedonist. And so the idea is if you can do this as often as you can throughout the day while letting your thoughts go in about 22 to 66 days, you'll rewire your brain to begin doing it automatically, effortlessly, spontaneously. Wow. I'm kind of my word for the day is wow. <laughs> I really am blown away, Robert. This is truly an, an honor to listen to you. It's like I'm in this amazing workshop on happiness on life this is such a privilege i'm so grateful robert thank you for sharing all your amazing wisdom and my fearless friends again you need to check robert's book happiness from the inside out i swear to god you will have a difficult time stop to stop reading it because i have it on my phone <laughs> it's like i'm spending more time on my phone now but it's the best time. It's time well spent. Of course, I encourage you to get the paper back. That's the best feeling in the world. Have a look at Robert's amazing work. Have a look at Robert's book. And Robert, I could listen to you for hours, for days. Before we go today, can you please tell us where can our listeners and viewers, where can they get in touch with your amazing and out of this world work 
So first, I want to thank you for being so kind and compassionate and encouraging and um, generous with me, um, and also so wise and insightful. It's just obvious and evident and clear how much time and work you've dedicated um, to deepening and integrating the wisdom that you have and sharing it with the rest of us. So thank you for that. It means the world to me. I appreciate um, that. Thank you. Welcome. Um, and for folks who want to find out more about me and my work, you can go to my website, which is coachrobmack.com. Uh, you can also find me on most all social media platforms, probably most consistently Instagram at Rob Mack, M A C K official. Uh, and you can find my uh, both books that have been published Happiness from the Inside Out and Love from the Inside Out, which just is recently published. Uh, everywhere great books are sold, including Barnes and Noble and Amazon. This is Wonderful, Robert. Thank you for such an amazing conversation. I truly hope to have an in-person conversation with you in the following period because this has been elevating for me. My mind is now spiraling and I just have so many amazing things to think about, like what you said about the breath. I've never heard that anywhere and it just blows my mind how accurate it is. The breath that we have now, my fearless friends, just think about it, how wise and how deep it is. It's the only one you have. It's not like you have a bag with future breaths. It's not like you can analyze your past breaths, as Robert says. This is really, this is brilliant. And I just feel so privileged and so lucky really grateful to have been able to get this information from you to absorb it all and to pass it forward because what we're doing here at the end of the day is helping each other building a beautiful community and I am so thankful Robert thank you for this wonderful time and I can't wait to finish your amazing book oh I'm the pleasure and privilege and honor has been all mine I mean Thank you so much. I'm so looking forward to collecting on that big hug when I see you in person, hopefully soon. Congrats on the book. Um, and thank you so much for the work you do. And most importantly, for who you are. It's um, palpable. Like I can feel the positive, loving, healing energy that you send out to the world through the screen. So thank you so much. Thank you, Robert.